Okay, shall we start <laughs> now? Okay, so today, today we invited two artists, Professor Grace Munakata and Professor Michael Hall to talk about their work that they presented in this exhibition. So these are the four works that they presented in this exhibition. And congratulations for your, <coughs> congratulations on presenting your artwork in this exhibition. And thank you for joining us to talk about your work today. So your painting reflect what is happening around us now and also explain how current circumstance made an impact on your artwork, especially based on your works presented in this exhibition. So Grace, would you like to talk first? So I have your images. Um, okay. So uh, Joanne, would you like to talk me to talk about both of the works or kind of one at a time? Or shall we switch between Michael and I? Like talk about one work and then talk about the other? I don't know, it's up to you. Well, okay, I'll just, so I'll just, yeah, I'll just maybe start out then with, yes. with this piece. And um, this particular piece was actually done, you know, well before uh, the virus and the wildfires. But um, the ideas of, not the ideas, the experiencing an environment and sense of place and memory are sort of, have been constants in my work for a long time. Um, so now, of course, um, with the wildfires on top of everything else, I'm thinking a lot more about kind of immediate losses that we're experiencing you know, in terms of habitat, in terms of you know, forests, people's lives, people's homes. Um, you know, I mean, this has impacted everyone, but obviously certain communities much more than others. Um, but I would say that, uh, again, in general, um, the relationship of the whole body of work to the current situation is just have made me even more aware of issues of sustainability, um, the relationships within ecology, you know, that, you know, it's the things that we take for granted, like being so happy that right now we can take a deep breath, kind of literally, yeah. uh, with, without an air purifier. Um, but, you know, every day we depend on um, plants to produce oxygen, because they're the only thing that can. And uh, photosynthesis, which is how glucose is made, so carbon in water, making glucose, and then we wouldn't survive without the glucose. So I mean, we, we wouldn't be able to think. We literally, it's powering what we're saying right now. And we consume it, whether it comes in the form of vegetables or animals, potato chips, and, uh, all those. And <laughs> um, but, but they're kind of these things we take for, often take for granted, but again, there is this underpinning and we're, we're, we're so connected. And I think we, you know, we also, we have such a responsibility to take care, take care of our environment, take care of each other. I think, I think that's probably enough. Yeah. Did you want me to talk a little bit about the painting or, or? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. I also want to talk about how the current environment made an impact on, like, when you create these paintings, like Masako's Boat, and also. Okay. So again, the um, that first painting, Masako's Boat, um, was done before. You know, it was finished probably around January, and I was um, I'd spent uh, part of the fall at an art residency in Munson, Maine, which is kind of in the center of Maine. And I left at the end of uh, the fall color. Well, I mean, I left and there was still fall color. Let me kind of rephrase that. And I was lucky enough, my studio had an entire wall facing a four acre lake. No, it was bigger, way bigger than four acres. And, um, and then my studio, 
Yes, exactly. And so this was my view out my studio windows. And so how could you help? Well, I couldn't help but be really uh, kind of glued to all the changes that were occurring both throughout the day, um, into dusk, into evening, changes of weather, so you have these beautiful calm days, you know, placid glassy lake, then uh, cloudy days, ripples on the lake, 24 loons popping up out of the water, you know, otters, you know, kind of muscularly moving through the water. And um, I know it's really bad, but the kind of the searing light on the lake, I just was mesmerized. So I would like stare at this blinding light because I never experienced anything like that. And uh, I've also, I'm a kind of Californian. And so I have very little experience of snow and winter. Um, so just that transition of kind of all of a sudden it was snowing. And uh, a lot of the, some of the people at the residency were from the East Coast or from that area. And I'd be kind of, the snow glitters at night and the glitter is colored and it jumps off the surface. And my friend Jody, who is a writer, she said, Grace, yeah, and that only happens in Maine. And I'd be like, really? And so, you know, so people kind of thought I was uh, kind of funny, I think that way. But again, it's just, it was magical. And these ice rings, the circles that started to appear. So the kind of colors and the sensations of light, um, that was my, environment. And when I started that painting, I was literally looking outside at the lake. So kind of initially, I actually have been kind of uh, placed in some of the, some of the, sh you can't see it from here. So <laughs> the shapes of uh, the trees and shapes of the patterns of, of uh, light and shadow. And then, um, and then my way of working is very improvisational. So, um, I, even if I start with a kind of preliminary sketch with colors and so forth, I'm unable to stay with that for any period of time. So it, kept, it went through multiple changes. And at one point it was filled with these sort of uh, organically shaped uh, ridged clouds, which uh, you see in Japanese Heian period um, scrolls. Uh, and I love them because they're both because of the pattern and how they divide the space. So often you're peeking in from a bird's eye view down into say a forest or down onto looking onto people. Um, and so I had these sort of pastel colored clouds and then it was, again, the weather was very, becoming very gray. <clears throat> again, very stark changes of light and dark. And then I kind of impulsively went in and then the painting became instead uh, kind of two vertical areas, a large area of gray and then a smaller area of very dark. And um, I wasn't trying to translate exactly because uh, it's not about sort of being like Monet and trying to capture um, aspects of light and color and architecture at the moment, and then coming back the next day with a different painting to do it at a different time of day. It, and it's not really either about kind of a culmination or summing up of that. It's just kind of ingesting all this and then responding. So again, the painting then changed to this movement from gray into black, which was again, kind of like the ice sheets encroaching on the lake. And, but it also reminded me still of sky. And again, kind of the drift of say fog banks into a clear night sky. So there's still some remnants of those Japanese clouds that they sort of look like the ridges sort of gold linear shapes that look sort of like the edges of leaves. And um, the painting was, had become rather gray. And in the photographs of the landscape, especially the ones with the snow, you'll see all of these kind of hues of lavender and pink and gray blues and um you know, which were actually there i mean we get it and uh so that's already in the painting and then i needed i just wanted something i guess that was uh an impact of sort of strong vivid color 
so this flat shape is kind of caught or traversing from I guess left to right. And again, I didn't start out thinking it was anything in particular, but I like the kind of amalgam of the different shapes that are kind of held almost like it's a vehicle carrying some kind of cargo that's made up of, again, these sort of jewel-like colors, organic shapes. And again, like now I can look at it and say, well, it's, it's almost like a seed, you know, where you have a seed coat that protects this cargo of this embryo and these infant leaves um, that germinates. Or you could say, oh, well, it's kind of like this cargo that contains like a person's memories and, you know, experiences, or you know, it, it can be whatever you want. Um, but the title is Masako's Boat because um, uh, Masako was my mother, but um, she passed away when I was uh, only 24. And um, her, when she was, she was born in Washington. And when her father uh, went to uh, inform, you know, the officials that she'd been born, they couldn't understand him. So she became Martha. But so she was only Masako to her family. And, um, you know, she, she didn't really, she wasn't really able to have a, a childhood as we would think of one. So she, this was very common at the time. She was sent from um, Washington to Japan when she was about four or five uh, to live with a grandmother. And she was with her little brother. And it was really difficult because, um, Japanese who were from the United States uh, were subjected to a lot of, you know, um, bullying from other children. And then when they returned, when they were, say, 17, 18, they had to relearn English. And then not, and she wasn't able to go to college. So it's like my father was. So I'm kind of, I'm sort of in between that generation of almost first generation to college. And it was something she really wanted for me. <clears throat> and then after, after returning to the United States, shortly after getting married, then there was the World War II internment. So, um, so I often just think of, wish that she could have had uh, different opportunities and uh, kind of an ability to kind of be comfortable in her world and move freely in that world and it's kind of what i wish for for all of our students and so anyway so i often there's this sort of idea of being able to insert this idea of her into an environment where there's travel and again there's this kind of all kinds of possibilities okay Sure. Yeah, thank you for your wonderful talk. Because when I first look at this image, I just wonder who is Masako. Then, based on your experience, I can now see this painting conveys your personal experience with your like the environment and also like about your family, your mm -hmm. mom. Yeah. 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 And would you like to talk about the next image, or Michael, you wanted to go ahead to talk about one of the images and then turn around? Yeah, maybe, maybe Michael could go. Um, yes. Sure, I'm uh, happy to. Um, so, uh, uh, like Grace, the, the, the series that this um, kind of uh, germinated from was, it was started pre-COVID and um, uh, I think a lot of artists found themselves, um, you know, in the middle of a uh, body of work or making um, work that was directed one way and um, found themselves responding, um, you know, later uh, within, you know, that same body of work, trying to find a way to kind of deal with what was happening in the now, at least I did myself. Um, so uh, this series of work, which was called Belongings, um, started uh, be when I, uh, first learned that my wife was pregnant and uh, that we were gonna have a child. Um, and um, what it made me do was start to, to really look back and think about 
um, information and items and experiences that helped me to become the person that I am over, uh, you know, uh, many years. And um, to start to think about how I would uh, present those things to my son, um, how we would um, have conversations about that, you know, what, what type of information would I be passing along? What type of, and, and thinking also about like, what type of world, um, you know, we're passing along. Um, and this diptych, uh, coming of age came about, um, you know, after COVID had already been in place, um, and, you know, social distancing and everything. But then, um, on top of that, um, uh, after the murder of George Floyd and the BLM protests and, um, you know, uh, the, the racial inequality in the United States, uh, really, you know, being, um, finally you know, recognized at least um, by some, uh, denied by others. Um, and uh, for me, uh, I wanted to find a way to, con to, to speak to this, this moment within this series and um, talking about those kinds of issues with my son was gonna be a, a very important uh, part of uh, uh, growing up and, and, and understanding um, the world that we live in and, and how to be an equitable and empathetic human being. Uh, so I remember when I was growing up, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird was a, was a book that um, always was heralded as uh, in school as being this book that began the conversation on race. And um, looking back at it now, it's actually a very short-sighted book. Um, and uh, even though it has a wonderful character, you know, some wonderful characters in it, it's also um, uh, very problematic, um, it, you know, uh, looking back at it with, with uh, you know, not um, these, uh, you know, being less uh, graceful with it, you know, uh, like letting, uh, really taking a look at, at what's being said in the book without kind of giving it a pass. Um, even though it was a very, uh, it was a book that, I loved uh, reading and I loved the film with Gregory Peck. Um, I reread it during this um, and uh, really found it problematic in many places. Um, and then uh, I wanted to pair that with a book that I felt addressed a similar period of time uh, that was more representative of the, the actual and genuine experience. And Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings um, has a very paralleled, um, uh, you know, uh, experience, but very, very, very different takes on, um, uh, on what that experience is, you know, very similar ages of the, of the two main characters. Um, and so I wanted to, to put these together as a way of, um, contrasting one another and, and kind of looking at, uh, the greater context of these things, that these conversations, run deep and that they're very complicated um and uh you know that um you know it's uh for me it was also a kind of a being very mindful of reevaluating you know the sources of information that i ingest and that, that i consume um and how i then will reflect those to my son and then how he and i will ultimately have conversations hopefully um, and, um, that, that's kind of the crux of this whole series is thinking through, um, you know, these objects that surround me every day, um, and that have been meaningful in my life and reevaluating them and really looking at, at, uh, not just what they meant to me then, but now looking at them in, in a, you know, a, you know, more current circumstance. Um, and um, what I know now, you know, and how does that change them? How do I perceive them differently? How will those those objects then move into the future with me and 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 my experience as now a father and 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 with my son and my wife and as a family? Um, so uh, the whole series um, uh, involves objects like this, um, you know, books, uh, 
some movies, some objects that uh, you know I've carried with me that maybe have a story behind them for myself. Um, but this one was uh, probably the one that responded most to the moment um, and uh, you know our changing circumstances uh, uh, during this time. So that's one reason why I wanted to include this one in the exhibition. Um, yeah. Thank you for your talk. So you appreciate the office around it, you, you and I guess becoming a father and having a kid is really big transition in like one's life. So as, as you already mentioned that you have have a kid and then it also becomes a part of your painting. So why don't you talk about a little bit about your second work sure. and then move to Grace's work. Yeah. Sure, sure, yeah. So um, this is actually one of the last pieces I did in, in this series. Um, it's, it's an ongoing series, but I, I had an exhibition of it over the summer, actually, and um, this was one of the, the last pieces I did for it. Um, and uh, this is called First Look. This is a, a, a painting of the first time that my son and I looked at each other in the eyes. This is right after he was born. Um, he was, uh, you know, delivered by cesarean and it was it was a it was this it was actually kind of a tense moment um it was an emergency cesarean and um uh my there was this moment when my son was brought over to the table and i didn't hear anything um, and then he was just surrounded by doctors and nurses and i had no idea what was going on and i'm there with my wife and trying to comfort her and trying to uh, listen for my my son and not hearing anything and it felt like an eternity waiting for that that cry um, and uh, it, it was unlike anything I you know have ever experienced um, and uh, you know uh, eventually I, he he uh, cried and his lungs were clear and um, I was able to go over and and see him and uh, he would sat he was we sat him up and he just turned to me with these very weary eyes he's been through this incredible ordeal and looked up at me and we've just connected um and it was a very powerful moment for me and it kind of um became this uh this this kind of uh experience that's now shaping a lot of the work that i do you know thinking back to how what I do not only impacts myself, it impacts my family, it impacts my son. So, um, and, uh, you know, that carries through from my artwork and, and that carries up into like how I uh, respond to the world and what I, what actions I take within the world. Um, so it, it's this, um, these paintings are kind of also markers for me and, and reminders to me um, to, to continue to try to make uh, a you know a better world <laughs> in whatever way I can um, and, yes, right. and in terms of of like the materials and and responding to to um, kind of the times or the, to, to constraints or anything like that uh, um, you know these are all watercolor on paper stretched over a panel and um, the reason I shifted to watercolor is because I, I wanted a non-toxic practice. I also needed something that I could work on um, in in patches and and could, could because my my time is much more constrained now um, and uh, so and also in smaller scale than I've worked before um, so that um, I can I can actually uh, finish these things and complete these things so that the kind of isolated object and the, the isolated figure um, allows me to kind of just focus on that one thing and also to uh, to be able to you know tactfully thinking it through like I, something I can finish in uh, in a period of time and that I can move around with me um, so it was uh, uh, a, you know sometimes you have to choose the materials um, and sometimes um, you know, alter things to kind of meet your circumstance. And so this is an example of that. Yeah, okay. 
That's good. So tell me your work like conveys your, how you view the world and also how you see your own family and your own personal life, right? So yeah. it's good. And Grace, would you like to talk about your second? Actually, could I say something about Michael's work? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Okay, well, okay. Um, I was just thinking, well, several, several things. One is that even though uh, I'm seeing these flat because they're on a screen, uh, mm -hmm. it just seems to, it makes so much sense to me that these have to be on separate panels because there is the contrast between the outlook of Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, from the point of view of these young children from a you know, white lawyer's family and then the Maya Angelou book. So they don't, even if they were on one panel, exactly the same size, exactly the same distance, they need that kind of physical object separation, I think. And I also was thinking um, this, how important it is that you show uh, in detail kind of the, the um, marking up of the book, the aging of the book. So, you know, the, yeah, the yeah. sort of, it looks like, I don't know if they had a, like a plastic cover or something, but it's like the fraying of the edges, um, you know, how the, the plastic is kind of peeling away. So it also denotes that it's both very handled, as like, it looks like something that you carried around in your backpack for yeah. multiple years, and, and that it comes from a different time period. You know, so you know, I can go online and get a brand new copy of e either of these books, but this also conveys, again, this is from a particular time period that is now, well, the time period has passed, although many of the same issues are unfortunately still very much ongoing. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, and it's, I guess, also just that nice contrast of, again, the sort of wearing and age and use and handling with a very clean uh, presentation against yeah. the, the white background and, and the objects. And yeah. then, yeah, and then I, I, I had, agree. yeah, and I had some comments on, uh, and Michael, you can disagree. That wasn't my intention at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that, no, that, that's great. I, I really appreciate you saying that because, yeah, that, that, that is very much a, a part of it, you know. Right. Uh, and right. That they are, that they do show wear, that they're not brand new copies, yeah. that there is right. like a sense of history and use uh, that are kind of embedded in them. Yeah. Yeah. Even uh, like thanks. the shadows, the shadows that um, you can see, you know, cast by the panel. Uh, I think it's important because again, it, 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 it just, they, they become kind of their paintings and little sort of sculpture presences. Hmm. Okay. Um, Thanks, Grace. Yeah, oh, you're because, yeah, because of the COVID, we cannot see the actual painting, but I wanted to see at one point, like the actual one. Oh, yeah. 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 But I promise I won't touch it, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I promise too. <laughs> Yeah, I really wanted to touch it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Okay, so and then and then the painting of Irving. Oops, oh. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. I I was just trying to figure out the scale because this is uh, 24 inches tall. So I was thinking that Irving. This is probably about half or two thirds his actual size at the time. No, this is actually him to scale as oh, far as really? I could equate. Yeah. So. One of the other things in, in the series is that it's very important to me that everything's a one-to-one -one scale. One-to-one -one ratio. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, because I because of that 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 kind of objectness, like I think that right. that reflecting back the actual object right. as an object and as a new object is a, a, an important thing. And so I tried to make this to scale as much as possible. So my wow. hand, that's my hand reaching in, and that's. My, I even I recognize scale with my hand. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Th I think that makes a big difference because I, I obviously I can't tell right now because it's small on the screen, but it's sort of life, you know, to be to look at this and know again to have a sense of this is actual depiction of Irving, and I also love that you know there's nothing around it, so 
you know, you've eliminated any kind of ground, you know, there's no table, there's no window. It's just kind of, it's like the books, you sort of isolated it. It was kind of like an Avedon sort of thing uh, where the, and you've allowed your sleeve. So from the cuff, then it sort of gradually just disappears into the white atmosphere. So the point of connection that also holds kind of literally well, not literally, it sort of holds the baby in place as a formal issue, is like your hand and the connection to his head. So it's like this very strong kind of L shape, you know, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's so much about that connection and yeah, he does look really weary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's really lovely. Yeah, every detail has the meaning. <laughs> That's what yeah. you yeah. yeah, I think it's it's interesting too because um, I I respond very strongly to to Grace's work because of um, the 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 sense of uh, intuition and play and and the working with the materials and and responding to um, you know the environment and the shapes and colors that she's seeing you know whether that's in her garden or with whether that's in Maine um, and and then how that becomes this poetic reflection on like, you know, your own family uh, with your mother and, and, um, you know, I, it, for me, it's, it's, I, it's so, um, liberating to, to look at your work and, and have that kind of like release of, of, of kind of being a little bit more fluid and, and being, you know, more responsive and, and intuitive, um, and just like looking at your your thought process as you're you know as I'm looking at the painting I'm like looking at you know oh you know how you put this layer in and then scrape through and then this goes on top and then a texture and then brought back this color and maybe pop that color around and so just the 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 way that I, you know uh, you can kind of read the, your painting you know like it, I, I always I, I love looking at that um, in particular, because you know, my work is so different than that, my work is so much more analytic than it is intuitive um, in, in the way that, but, it, at least in the way that it's constructed. Um, right, but, yeah. your, but your work, and it, it, you are kind of pulling together, consolidating maybe so many different ideas and thoughts, and then kind of coming up with an image that, you can channel all of those emotions into and yeah. you know sometimes i am jealous of people who can start and gradually finish something and it doesn't like turn upside down and backwards on them uh in in the doing but what i've kind of decided it's sort of like you know that's i think one thing that's wonderful for this our students who are going to continue being makers that you know, you are who you are. Um, that sounds really smart. Um, but that um, you know, it'd be like me wishing I could be a giraffe, or me wishing I could be a light bulb. You know, I just <laughs> you, you, you know, you respond to the yeah. world the way you know. It has all to do with um, all the experiences that you've had and how you how you move forward. I guess. So yeah. um, I'd actually like Michael to talk about my next pain instead of me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna go back. Yes. <laughs> okay. So um, I, I'm sorry, Jawan. Did you have? Sorry. Oh, I cannot hear you. Oh, Grace. I think your your audio just went out. Um. Oh you, yes. Oh, there you go. You're back. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. It says my internet connection is unstable. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so when I was starting this painting, um, this was during COVID, but before the wildfire started. And um, my husband and I do as, as much hiking as we can, uh, or used to, <laughs> and uh, loved going to, you know, uh, Point Reyes and taking hikes around Mount Wittenberg and uh, you know the little Bear Valley Trail and like, going to the coast, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I've kind of created also. This is I'm not sure this makes sense, but uh, in the garden, um, 
we have this little postage stamp garden between the house and our studio is uh, behind the garden. And so gradually it's become an almost all native garden. And so it attracts, it's, it's like the, the, uh, the movie, um, you know, planted and they will come. So at any rate, uh, I wanted this, this I, I knew that I wanted to do a painting that was kind of about forests. And then I had this um, folly. So, you know, I, I, I love reading about natural history and uh, ecology, and I also read take regular literature, and I do read the New York Times and so forth, although it's really hard lately. But um, my husband spent uh, time at a residency that was very, very remote, and there were literally redwood trees that were thousands of years old and Sitka spruce and he also had a lake and when he came back <clears throat> he brought back some things for me there was no gift store there since it was so isolated so he brought things like you know feathers and little uh dried wildflowers and this little tiny huh. pine cone and yeah. so I I brought all these little treasures into my studio and you know, pine cones, they start out like this, right? And so when they mature, then those little kind of leaves open up and these little seeds started falling on my studio uh, on one of the tables. And I thought, wow, it would be so cool if this, he loved this place. If I could, I could grow something and it would be alive and it would be from this place. So I read up on how to, how to uh, you have to simulate winter conditions. So I put the seeds in the refrigerator and then I forgot about it because we went into online teaching in mid-March. Mm -hmm. And then in June, I noticed there was this container in the fridge, I thought, what is this? And it was labeled, it said the lake, January something something. And I brought it out and I put it outside and it was kind of remarkable because they started to sprout. Gradually, so and the you know, so the seed kind of comes up and it almost has like little fingers like this under the seed capsule. Like it goes like this, and I'm like whoa, whoa! And my husband, I told him what they were, and I could tell he was more bemused than amazed. And then I started reading about because then I I figured out oh this was a Sitka spruce, and it's like oh my god, they grow to be 300 feet tall. They grow to have a 40 foot wide branch spread. They can get to be 15 feet in diameter. And I felt, you know, for all of my kind of being interested in habitat, blah, blah, it's like I made such a mistake because I couldn't even put one, like one tree would like consume our entire lot. And um, so I felt kind of silly. And although that hasn't stopped me from See, they're still here. And, um, and in, in nature, of course, you know, pine cone seeds, you know, drop by, you know, thousands and thousands and millions of seeds when they're ready, and then they get eaten. So they get eaten by squirrels and birds and yum, yum. Yeah. And then a few of them manage to fall down somewhere and then they have to like have the right conditions. They need light, they need this, they need that. Anyway, so very few of them actually survive to become trees. Uh, and I was talking to someone about my experience with these seedlings and how, you know, duh. And she said something about maybe they would fit in your painting. So um, this painting that was kind of about forest and I, Again, this went through lots and lots of stages. And so at each stage, it would look one way. And then I'd think, oh, it's a little bit too gray. And I don't, you know, it needs more contrast. And then it would all of a sudden change. And then I have a new situation. And, um, but I wanted to have a sense of an evolving of forest or habitat where I didn't want, you know, kind of a traditional 
flat plain with big trees in the front and smaller trees in the back, kind of foreground, background. What I actually started to want as it developed was sort of there, you wouldn't be able to tell, but I can tell. There are sort of some trees that would be say 400 feet tall, but they're you know in the painting a few inches tall. And then there are little tiny seedlings like at the very bottom of the painting and some floating around the upper left uh, that are very small. And I wanted this sort of sense of things hovering, sort of suspended or floating upwards and this kind of, again, cycle. And then with the fires, <laughs> it's like these places that, you know, again, we just uh, love going to. And you know, this is happening now also in Oregon, Washington. Um, these places we were walking through, they were so moist and full of waterfalls and moss and uh, we we're noticing that these areas where they're the burn area from the Mount Vision fire about 20 years ago, now these new trees were getting tall enough, they're almost up here in the view. And they're all gone now. That whole, that area, well, they're not all gone, but that whole area is within the burn area of the, yeah. And, you know, but again, there's, there's regeneration. And, you know, it happens in a regular forest where, again, things decay, but it's like through the decay that provides, you know, nourishment and habitat for things growing. And now, again, we have these devastating fires that have, you know, destroyed structures and homes and the landscape. But again, you know, we will persist. It might not be during my lifetime, but um, things come back. It's sort of well, and also again, what, what hopefully we can do to try to um, stem climate change, just in you know, yeah. little things, you know, it's just trying to be as sustainable as possible in our practice. Like Michael's using watercolor because he wants a non-toxic environment, probably both for his son and just, you know, working in his studio. Um, I use acrylics primarily for the same reason. And I've, reluctantly relinquished all of my uh, cadmiums and cobalts and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah, it's just, you know, it's, it's not good for the environment. So if I'm going to be whatever, raising caterpillars and planting uh, native plants, it's like then it's again, little things, you know, organic cotton, like, and having really old stuff because, um, you know, if it's usable, it's usable. It's like, what's wrong with that? Anyway, um, I, I think I'm, as usual, I'm just going all over the place. Um, at one point, the painting started to feel really gray to me. It felt almost done, but it also felt really gray. And that's what led to all the kind of patches of very vivid kind of rectangular kind of, uh, what do you call it? Sort of not exactly like a checkerboard. It's kind of like a quilt that's coming apart. Uh, and I wasn't, again, I wasn't thinking about anything really specific. I was just thinking kind of chlorophyll, green, and sort of layers and uh, color. And, you know, that's that kind of thing of like, even now, you know, people are walking around and everyone's wearing masks. And I mean, in, on our street, everything's both covered with ash and uh, silica dust from the road paving. And then you see like, whatever. Um, a lavender wildflower and it's like whoa you know and um it's all those things the sort of resilience and you know a little bit of hope it's kind of you know it's like you know you're gonna be let's be stubborn and we're gonna insist on a little hope yeah. so when you go outside you maybe it might be a little bit cheerful to wear a handmade colored mask <laughs> <laughs> made out of recycled materials oh it just it looks beautiful <laughs> yeah so yeah. your your painting started really small yeah small objects but then it conveys really important message for our generation and also next coming generation too yeah. so as you already talked a little bit about challenges that you encounter i just wanted when you guys talk a little bit about what kind of challenges you encounter when you work on your projects and how you move forward. Let's have Michael talk first. He's, he's, he's so streamlined. 
Am I? Yes, you are. <laughs> you are. Um, well, I think, uh, you know, with this series in particular, it, it, it was the, the challenges of knowing a limitation of time and, um, uh, you know, um, where I where I could paint and, and, you know, what I could accomplish in, in a given time. Um, so it was kind of strategizing uh, that and that kind of helped develop the idea and helped me uh, kind of shape the project. Um, so sometimes those constraints and those limitations or those those things that complicate something or or maybe take you away from uh, an original idea or maybe take you out of like what your you know um, your regular practices sometimes can be uh, these strange gifts that that allow you. Um, a new way of thinking or looking um, and and putting something together. Um, so, um, and 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 it was that this project was definitely that for me. Um, uh, for this, I also knew uh, I wanted the objects to have this this feeling of being an object, you know, the painting to be an actual object itself too. So, I didn't want them to just be uh, sheets of paper. Um, I knew that they needed to have more presence as an object. So that's when I started to stretch them, uh, the wet watercolor paper, stretch it over a wood panel. And then, um, and then it had this, this presence, it, you know, it was lifted off the wall, it stood on its own. Um, and, uh, and that, that really changed a lot uh, for me too. Um, uh, so, you know these limitations or these these things that that can sometimes um, l seem like you know like a block or a, a thing you know something getting in the way you know if you allow it to yeah sure you know you'll stop making work um, but if you are persistent and you um, you know use it as a uh, an opportunity to creative problem solve um, it can also be this this kind of amazing gift to finding a new way of working. Um, and then, you know, in terms of like COVID and, and then teaching online and everything, um, that's a t different type of complication. And, um, you know, it's just been, we're, we're, we're just stacking up complications uh, and, and problems um, uh, kind of regularly now. Uh, so it, it's, you know, it, the weight of that definitely, um, I'm, I definitely am starting to feel that. And it, it, it's somewhat hard to um, concentrate in the studio and sometimes hard to, um, you know, to, to, you know, push through that. But, you know, I know that I just need to continue to, to do that and, and work through that and that maybe, you know, there'll be this kind of lull or, you know, maybe the work won't, um, come out as easily or uh, as well. Um, but, you know, have like, I think, Grace, you said this, you know, like have like, you know, kind of faith in, in the process and, and just kind of keep moving, um, moving of ahead, you know. Um, I mean, there's arts, ultimately this optimistic act, you know, um, that we're, we're making these things um, for ourselves and for others, you know, after us. So it's this, it's this very optimistic kind of yeah. activity that we do, even if it, it's sometimes uh, difficult and, and tiring and um, uh, problematic. <laughs> yes, Grace, you would you like to talk about challenges? Um, yes, and I have move forward. <laughs> I haven't had as many challenges right now as Michael since I'm not teaching this semester, um, or at least I haven't had those kind of challenges. I've just been uh, empathizing from the sidelines and yeah, so I, I'm fully capable of getting all worried even not being there. But um, in terms of my own work, I'd say um, the, some of the challenges uh, are just, I, 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 I think now in a way it's just part of the way that I work. It's not, it's not, I don't even know that it's a challenge. It's just the way I work. But again, um, occasionally, well, no, it, this happens all the time. Um, I even had 
when I was in Maine during, at that residency, I had this idea that I, I was making a lot of small collages. And then I thought, you know, these come together rel relatively quickly and I could scale them up, you know, and use them as a departure point for a painting. And yeah. I, I even like, I, so I, I had a small collage and then I sort of scaled it up on a painting and I did kind of fairly faithfully painted in the shapes and colors and patterns and then it all disappeared. And uh, so it's like, you know, I just, yeah. So, Sometimes it, it's, um, what is it? It's kind of funny, baffling um, <laughs> to, you know, that it's very possible for me in 10 minutes, I can have a painting I've been working on for, I don't know, let's say five weeks. And in 10 minutes, it's reverted to a brand new, new painting. And oh. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not a process of kind of linear process of going forward with what was there before. It's mm -hmm. kind of having to deal with, okay, now I'm in a new, a different place. If I, I'm usually anchored by some kind of an idea or a feeling, but again, it's, it's more sort of a response to the actual working. So for me, it's like the tactile aspects of actually applying the paint, the rhythms, and something that uh, someone noticed this like ages ago when I was doing a, a sort of residency a long time ago, and people could come and watch me, which was very weird. And someone said, you know, sometimes when you are painting, you're not looking at where you're painting. Um, and my husband said something like that about the way I garden or the way I water. So sometimes I'm aiming the hose one direction, but I'm looking somewhere else. But um, what happens is, um, I'm now aware of doing it intentionally, because if I have say this is a not a huge painting, it's only four feet tall. But sometimes I'll be making marks, but I'm not looking exactly where I'm painting because I'm sensing where the mark and color are and how they're how they're relating to the whole thing. And um, and then and then when I'm lucky, the painting just tells me. It just sort of says, pale gray here, upper left. So I go out <laughs> to mix the color. And then when I come back, it's sometimes like, no, 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 it's going to be brown and it's going to be over here. And so, you know, again, it's this sort of lack of a better word kind of dialogue that occurs. And again, my husband's also a painter and we share a studio with a very, very thick wall down the center and with separate doors. So, you know, we were not in each other's face, but sometimes he used to kid me and just say, why can't you just make five paintings? Uh, and I just can't. And part of it is also that I like being there. Sometimes it's like, I think I overwork a painting because I just, I don't want to leave that the place that it is. Is mm -hmm. I finally become really acquainted with that environment. It's like, oh no, I have to go. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I don't know. The other, other <laughs> thing, this is maybe has more to do with the little painting. You don't have to show it. But when I was, uh, when I've done several residencies, um, one in Iceland, East Iceland, and then in the Bishop Hills in Inverness and Maine, and I was going to go to one at the Cascade Head in Oregon, which I think may still happen, but the wildfires are within about six miles. Um, but at any rate, it's like when you have to fly somewhere or, any, or you're going to have a small studio or you have to ship your supplies. Um, again, you, you have to scale things to what it's possible to do. So for quite a while, I started working much smaller just because that was what I could deal with, you know, because I wasn't going to be shipping big paintings you know, across yeah. states or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I don't know, again, I don't know it's a limitation. It, it just sort of forces you to um, you can kind of work with what you have, work with what's possible, you know. In yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, based on your condition and environment. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, can you guys a little bit, <clears throat> a bit talk about your future project? Is it also Michael? related, is these two works are related to your future project or is separate? Or? Um, I, I think that um, my work is, I, I, I don't think 
I think that these pieces are sort of part of an ongoing series. So things just keep, they, they don't change radically, but uh, things do change. And it's like say right now, like in the moment during this week, for some reason, I don't have a desire to work representationally. So often in the works, I can include some kind of very, very descriptive elements that are sometimes partially hidden or sometimes, you know, they're in the painting. And um, I don't know, just right now, it just feels right to just be, to not, kind of not have a specific subject matter or again, it's like, I don't feel like I can describe the subject matter in a way that feels right to me by doing so representationally. So right now it's really about sensation and color mm -hmm. and shapes. Mm -hmm. And then that in itself then suggests something to me. So it lately I've been sort of thinking about the strata in soil, just the levels yeah. and then all the kind of components that are in there. But that's again, it's sort of coming from the painting. And then uh, something about the way that I work, it's, it's obviously pretty ambiguous, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's open-ended. And so I, I, I think this is kind of something people might think about that um, often the, what we end up with, it, again, it's not the sum of all those ideas that we started with and in work like mine, where it's sort of the concept is a moving target, um, the best situation is that the painting kind of leaves you and goes somewhere in the world and hopefully has somebody to respond to it. Um, you know, whether it's hanging out at a friend's house or it goes to a collector. And occasionally I've met collectors who tell me that they have a piece, but they don't necessarily want to know what I was thinking or what it was about oh, because uh, <laughs> because they've developed their own relationship to it and yeah. I think sometimes it's like their relationship makes almost like more sense than what I was thinking at the time <laughs> if that makes yeah so yeah maybe that's like, why they call they wanted to call like your work <laughs> right Basically. yeah they can read anything they want into it yes <laughs> <laughs> okay what about Michael um, so I'm, I'm continuing on with this, this series, um, but I think it's, it's uh, beginning to kind of transform a little bit um, uh, into maybe some larger, um, I, I, have, I have this impulse in me now to, to work a little bit larger um, and um, to have more complicated compositions uh, involving multiple objects. That's kind of where my head is starting to go, but I'm still um, addressing um, the, the series of responding to objects. Um, yeah, so we'll see. I don't yeah. know. I'm going to try to get through the semester yeah. first. <laughs> yeah, I look forward to seeing your upcoming project, maybe in next annual exhibition at CSU EV in person, oh, yeah. <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, okay, yeah, so, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> My last question is, I'm sure that a lot of students will watch this video and I wonder whether, whether you have some advice on their career in art creation. Just, yeah. For a student at CSUEB. Grace, you well, want to go first? Or? Sure. And actually, Michael, you addressed some of those things when you were speaking earlier. And yes. Okay. I was just thinking that, you know, our students every day there's uncertainty right um and again yeah. some of us are lucky enough that certain things are in place we have a house we have uh food etc but um but I, again michael was saying that making art making you know, writing all of those those uh things that come forth uh is essentially optimistic and i've been thinking that these things of kind of even making a mark, you know, kind of starting your artwork, making your sculpture, you know, with all of its own uncertainties, uh, it's a de declaration of hope. You know, you're, 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 you're declaring, I am here, I'm making this choice, I'm responding, 
And, you know, regardless of all the other stuff that's going on in the moment and how that's affecting the choices you're making, you're, you're kind of participating, you know, and this pandemic will be over at some point and we're going to persist. And um, Michael also has been talking quite a bit about um, dealing with different resources during this time. And uh, he and I talked about it briefly the other day. So, and so even when I was teaching last spring, it's like a lot of students, they didn't have, you don't have a studio to work in. You don't have your materials. You can't get to your locker because you're down South. So, you know, what do you make stuff with? And, you know, when you have assignments and, um, I think this could be, again, an opportunity by being more resourceful, being forced to be more resourceful, and maybe being able to be a little bit playful about it and kind of question, well, what is an appropriate material to be making a painting or sculpture with? It doesn't have to be oil paint. It could be uh, coffee stains. It could be coffee stains and popsicle stains. This is actually something some of my students ended up doing. Um, and you have to kind of literally use what you have at hand, possibly both for your materials and possibly for your source material for what it is you're making work about. And I just was remembering ages ago, uh, we had a guest speaker come to Hayward. Uh, and he was part of a group show of sculpture. And he had an anecdote, and I'm, I'm probably not going to get this exactly right, but he was sort of talking about, he was a mixed media sculptor. And he was talking about this kind of friendly argument that he had ongoing with a colleague who was again like, bronze, oil paint, I don't know about marble. And so I think partly, uh, not, not, as a, not as a joke, but partly as, again, a kind of declaration. You, know, you can make art out of anything. Yeah. He, he made a large, I believe it was a rooster, out first out of bronze, and then he made another one out of chewing gum. But it was pretty large, so he couldn't chew all the gum, all the <laughs> gum that he needed himself. So he was enlisting his colleagues, his wife, his students, they were all chewing gum and then giving him the little wads of chewing gum, which he would then sort of apply, stack, smoosh, to create the sculpture. And, um, and it was really a good piece. And it ended up getting like a really strong critical reception and winning awards. So, you know, there you go. Yeah. Just remember to use sugar-free. <laughs> 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 Okay, I'm gonna let uh, Michael speak. Uh, well, I, I mean, I think the thing that I, 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 I think the one thing that's really important is is to um, to really develop a, a peer group and and to to build a community, um, especially at EB. And I know that's a little bit more strained and difficult now over um, you know Zoom calls and everything, um, but it, it still can happen. Um, and I think it's an important uh, aspect of, a, of an artist's life because that's kind of how, that's how you, you kind of progress and, and move through opportunities and everything. I, and I, I certainly wouldn't be where I am without uh, the, the help and, and guidance and, and, um, and uh, care of, of, a, of a really strong peer group. Um, and, um, and I, you know, what, what Grace was saying is absolutely right. I mean, it's just persistence and, you know, it's, um, materials are just tools, you know, and, um, and, you know, some of them you love more than others and, and that's great and finding the ones that you, you would love to work with, but, you know, um, getting overly bound to, to a specific tool may be, uh, you know, may hold you up. So, you know, being open and responsive to your, your time and your situation and, and allow um, uh, your ideas and your, um, you know, your responses to kind of, to, to shift and, and build from, you know, what you have available. And I think to, to do what you can with what you have is an important part of, of being an artist and, and that creative problem solving. So I think yeah. this is a very 
uh, extreme example of it. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, we're, that we're kind of being, you know, forced into. Um, but I, I think it it really um, is uh, is something um, that uh, many artists do face. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, maybe not looking at it as um, uh, you know as as blocks or uh, you know or working with something else as settling, but maybe just trying to perceive everything as maybe creative problems to solve. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much. And it's really great to have both of you for this com conversation and also learn a lot of your, you and also your work as well. I'm sure that a lot of students, they receive a lot of information and also inspiration from you and your talk. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for your time and efforts for this event. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Jawan, for putting this together and and uh, you know throwing us some some great questions. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>